Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Our guest is USA Today bestselling author and native New Yorker, Quana Jackson. Aside from her career as an author, Quana is also a longtime advocate of diversity and equality in the romance genre, and a successful clothing designer who spent a decade creating women's sportswear for various fashion houses. Her novel, Real Men Knit, is a heartfelt romance that takes place in a beloved Harlem knitting shop, and Booklist raved that Jackson crafts a cute friends to lovers romance with a diverse cast of characters that emphasizes the importance of community and found family. So here's me, Erin Leaf, getting to talk with author Quana Jackson. All right, Quana, thanks so much for joining us here. Books connect us. How has it been going for you in quarantine? We're about four or five weeks in. Five weeks. Oh, thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Uh, are we five weeks in? It feels like, uh, yeah, five, six weeks. It feels like forever, doesn't it? It feels like forever. Um, I'm in Westchester, so that makes it feel a little bit longer. I feel like I've been tracking it for a while, so... Yeah, oh yeah it's going <laughs> yeah it, it's going it's okay <laughs> yeah okay it's, yeah it's it's strange but um I'm happy to say I like my own company my kids always said you're a person who likes their own company so that part is is fine it's just the worry about everything and everyone else that's hard so is it your normal practice to write at home or do you normally write in like coffee shops? Do you have an outside office sort of how has your writing practice had to adjust to right now? Cause I know you mentioned you do have a deadline coming up. So you've been working. <laughs> I have a deadline that's yeah coming up and seeing the light of day. Um, my no- well, my normal process is to write at home. So that has, that hasn't changed. Um, what has changed is just my normal day to day has changed around life and the quarantine and having uh, my husband at home. He's not at home all the time. Right now, he is out at work because he's considered an essential worker. He doesn't work in healthcare or anything like that, but he works in, in IT and he's essential at his job so that other people are able to be home. He's got to, you know make sure everything is running there. So they've pared down his office, but he's got to be there uh, a few days a week to make sure everything is running so that other people can social distance to be home. So that's a little, it's a little scary. Um, But he is home most of the time and most of the week. So I've got to sort of work around that. And then it's it's the work around um, being a little bit maybe too present on the news and social media and things like that, where I wasn't paying attention to it before, I'm paying attention to it so much more now. So that's sort of changed my writing schedule where I'm you know, up very late at night trying to get in words where I used to be more in the afternoon writing yeah. and working, but now I'm watching um, you know, news updates and things like that. How, what do you think of that? Because I think it's so difficult for a lot of us now that are home and the temptation is there to just be on Twitter or Facebook or yeah. just watching the news nonstop in a way that, I mean, I don't think it's particularly healthy. I think there has to be a line between obviously being informed and then letting it rule your life. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you found that balance? It sounds like maybe not, or how are you? I have not. Oh, yeah. I wish I could. I definitely have not. Um, I admire people who can find the balance. I um, talk to tons of tons of writers, a lot of my writer friends, and there are those who are like, just shut it off. You've got to just shut it down and shut it off. And I really do try to, but I don't have that personality to be able to shut it off and shut it out. Um, I'm like I said, I'm in Westchester, but most of uh, my children are just out of the house, and mm-hmm. I've got one in the city with my mom. Um, most of my family are right in Manhattan, and uh, then I've got a son in the Bronx. So it's just very hard for me to sort of shut out the news and what's going on there because you know, though I know I have absolutely zero control, I'm a very Type A control person. So I don't know. Fe- feeling informs me makes me feel like I have a little bit of control, though I know logically I have zero control over anything, but I just want to know things. So I can't shut it out. <laughs> it's, it's hard. That, it's hard. I need to find balance and I have zero balance. 
Listen, I feel like, like right now, the, I'm sort of one of those people. It's like I'd like to see my enemy coming straight ahead at me. I don't want to, you know. It's like a, a, it's like an old sort of maybe, you know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a New York thing. I'm like, you know, don't don't sit with your back to the door, you know. <laughs> sit facing the door. That's what I always do. My friends, <laughs> people are like, what are you doing? It's like I got to see the door, you know. So your newest book, uh, Real Men Knit, it's about a son taking over his mother's yarn store in Harlem um, and falling in love with a woman who helps him do it. Um, and it seems like now in the time of quarantine, a lot of people are returning to sort of handicrafts and making things. Isn't that great? Yeah. So what do you think it is about bread making, knitting, all these things that that makes people want to do it, especially now? I guess it's it might go back to, you know, wanting to have that sort of comfort of things that they remember growing up with, maybe, you know, and all, you know, I, I would think because, you know, knitting for me, um, I didn't learn, learn to knit from my grandmother. I learned to, I learned to crochet from my grandmother. And I remember watching her, she would crochet in our little apartment. I grew up in Harlem. In our apartment, she would make us these little crocheted slippers they were the, sl the most slipperiest things ever so you can really wipe out in those slippers which is what we look forward to because we would have races in the hallway with these slippers on but it was just the most amazing thing to watch her make all these slippers for all these kids and she was also a caregiver for um my nana was a caregiver for lots of other kids in the neighborhood she would watch like for lots of single mothers and things like that she was she would be a, a babysitter for when they went to work so she would make slippers for tons of kids throughout the years throughout the year to give them on Christmas so you really look forward to these slippers but just to you know have the ability to sort of craft something from nothing and then that sense of accomplishment when it's done it sort of gives you a bit of comfort and then you feel like um what I was getting to with that sort of when you're worrying to feel like you have control over something crafting sort of gives you that feeling it gives it to me I've always been um I'm not the best crocheter now because I forgot some of it but I'm not the best knitter either but I do knit I have to, <laughs> I always have to feel like I'm doing and you can see me doing something <laughs> my hands are always moving even when I'm not uh writing or creating I used to be a fashion designer in my previous life um so if I wasn't knitting, crocheting, I was sewing or drawing or doing something. It's like, I feel like I, when I'm doing and creating, it's not just a control thing, but it's like you get to see something coming out of it. You know, when the world is chaotic around you, that sort of sense that, okay, look, everything is crazy. Everything is kind of sort of a dumpster fire going wackadoo over here. But look, look at this wonderful thing that I, I did. I created start to finish and look, it, this worked out. So maybe that's why people are sort of gravitating towards handicraft, towards knitting or sewing, crocheting, bread making, you know, like how wonderful if you can bake and make something and make your family happy with this thing that you created. It's like, I think it's great, you know? Yeah. And hopefully during this horror show, that part we won't lose. I taught um, both my kids to knit when they were very young and they and it dropped off. They, they were like, okay, great. And they got it, but they let it fall. I have, I have boy, girl, twins. So I, I taught the boy and the girl to knit. And um, my daughter, you know, would pick it up a little bit here and there. My son let it fall off, but I recently retaught my son and my husband because I taught my husband too. And um, surprisingly but now I think it's helped my husband with meditation too it helped him he said he sort of kept going with it with the quarantine and with everything going on he's he's kept the knitting going and he likes it now <laughs> which I was like you're you're really liking this he, and I said why do you like it he says he said he can't think of he can't really worry while he's knitting he just he's just thinking about keeping the stitches going and getting on to the next line. He can't worry about what's going on. He can't worry about the bills and things like that. So he's found it meditative. So I think that's another thing too. When you're doing a crafty kind of thing, you really have to focus on that craft. You know, it's 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 horrible that people have, um, that now we have to have this, you know, grassroot mass making brigade that we have, in, in my opinion, because the government did not prepare for it. But it's also wonderful that that has given people uh folks another outlet have you found yourself crafting or knitting or or doing baking more um 
I do, I, I always have my knitting at hand. It's actually right on the, right on the bed behind me over there. I'll do a couple of stitches here and there, but because I'm under deadline right now, um, I'm on writing, writing the next story, but I'm always doing something <laughs> creative. So right now it's, it's, it's a little, it's a few stitches here and there. I, I always have my knitting. I do some of my knitting. Um, I a actually have, um, a pile of fabric next to me also. My sewing machine is also on the other, on the side of me because I have been collecting fabrics for when my next book is handed in to make a bunch of masks. <laughs> so I yeah. have a lot of projects. Like it's like it's like book first and then it's like, you know, shawl, shawl project that I'm knitting, but it's also the mask must come next, you know, it's like mask first because I definitely, you know, want to be on the want to be on the mask brigade also, you know, to help um you know, prepare a mask for my family and then some masks for my neighbors and friends that, you know, I want to be able to hand out also and uh, things like that. You know, my husband, we have a few masks here and he was on his way to work today and, you know, they have a car pick him up, you know, so I did have a couple and I was like, please give some to the driver today too who picks you up. He's like, okay, you know, so I do what I can in between things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, baking, I have not done, no, I have not done baking. But I have done cook, a lot more cooking, a lot, we, yeah. we, you know, can't go out, we can't go, we, you know, there's no going out and things like that. I'm, I'm not the world's greatest cook, I will admit to that, but um, we've done a lot more cooking at home. Baking feels like too much, mm -hmm. like, precision for me, mm -hmm. that it's like, you need this exact amount and this exact, and you need to know all the chemical reactions and everything. And I just get so overwhelmed. I'm like, mm, no, I'm like, I'll just make a stew where it's just you're putting stuff in a pot and then yep. it smells good. Like I'm like cooking. I love, I love to cook, but baking. I'm like, that's a whole different, that's a different thing. That seems too, too much. So. Yeah, I'm more of a cook than a baker though. <laughs> under my other pen name, uh, KM Jackson, I actually wrote two baking, two series set in a bake shop. And I came up with recipes and things like that. And it is very, you have to be very precise. And yeah. when I do bake, it's okay. My grandmother was a fabulous baker, but she, and, but she never, never wrote a recipe down. <laughs> so I was recreating her recipes and I came very close, but then suddenly it's like, I can do peach cobbler. Like I can do Southern things like cobblers and things. And I can do, my brother says I do great peach cobbler and I would make it for him every Christmas and things to come in. But suddenly I had to like, actually write the recipe down I was like I don't know how to measure these things <laughs> it's <laughs> like how do you measure like how, how you like, have to get precise this much. yeah it's exactly. this much yeah it's about <laughs> this it's you know it's a bunch of this and a little of that and it's it's yeah just a pinch of this and that and it's like uh oh yeah, yeah it's, you want the batter to look kind of like this yeah it kind of looks in a taste and as long as it tastes right it's okay yeah yeah I'd rather do it I'm like you I'd rather do a stew <laughs> give me yeah. a stew Stews are so easy. It's interesting to hear you talk about your grandmother. Um, and a big character in the book is <laughs> Mama Joy. And it seems like there are similarities there. Sort of like, what made you decide to write this book in this series set in this place now? Because it's not your first book. You've you've had mm -hmm. quite a career. So this book was brewing for me for a while, actually, a few, a couple, quite a few years. Uh, I've I've wanted to write this series. I've wanted to set something in Harlem for, well, actually everything is, everything I write is set in and around New York, but I've wanted to set something in Harlem for a while, but it sort of never really, the opportunities never really come up. And also, I guess this one gets a little bit more personal and maybe I shied away from it a little bit because it felt a little personal, but um, the idea came up, mm, I found a scrap of paper and I had to research it lately back in 2014. That's how long ago. And I know it's 2014 because I found the piece of paper that said guys knitting story. Um, <laughs> and it was from 2014. I was like, Oh, that was a long time ago. Um, and when I looked into it, it was back when those Ryan Gosling, Hey girl memes were <laughs> popular. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I was all over those. Mm -hmm. And then when researching them, um, and I know this because I was researching it because someone asked. Um, it came about because he did a GQ article where he said he was a knitter. And I was like, well, that's cool. And then I was looking into guys knitting and that's how I was like, oh, a guys knitting story. That would be, that would be really great. Um, 
And I sort of just let it go. I had a Hey Girl meme on my bulletin board. I keep bulletin boards sort of all over the house. It's like being, being married to a writer is probably so much fun. <laughs> That's my husband like the Like, oh, oh not yeah. So it's like I have bulletin boards like in the kitchen. There's a bulletin board in our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> It's like in our bedroom where you have pictures of like Ryan Gosling. It's like my poor husband with the most like his wife. He must be very confident home. that he's like, listen, it's fine. It doesn't change anything. It's fine. It's <laughs> fine. Like currently, it's like I have pictures of the one. There's the one in my. There's one in the office, the kitchen, the bedroom. It's like in like the one in the bedroom doesn't have Ryan Gosling on it now, but I believe there's there are you know K-pop stars on the on the one in the bedroom mm-hmm. now. It's like yeah, he he's a very confident man. We've been together over 30 years he's like he's like whatever whatever floats your boat if, if it if it makes a book it's your work it's fine he's like he has no exactly. problem with it but um so uh I had I've had that idea sort of just rolling around for a long time just sort of just a guy knitting story but then when it came time for me to sort of pitch another story idea I said you know maybe it's time for this guy's knitting story but I didn't really want to do the traditional shop run by women, you know, and then maybe a guy learns to knit from a woman or something like that. I said, how to, how could I possibly make this different? And I had sort of imagined a knitting shop in Harlem. I, and I could really vividly see the shop like in my head because, you know, Harlem being where, where I'm from, I sort of just could sort of just slot the shop. I could see it. I could picture it. I could see where it was. And I said, it would be great if this sort of, you know, what if the shop was sort of like, you know, run by guys, how could that work out? And then I said, you know, I would love it to be a family story, things like that. And then I remembered the movie Four Brothers um, back in the day with, um, I think it was Donnie Wahlberg and was in it. And, and all the brothers were, um, were all adopted by the same mom. I was like, that could be sort of a cool thing. What if they were all, you know, Di- different ethnicities that could be a cool premise you know <laughs> and and that's sort of where the idea came from and then I ran from there and that's where the real men that came real men that idea came from so obviously you're a romance novelist mm-hmm. and I love romance been yeah. reading it a while it's, it's so fun and something that I love about romance and romance authors is that there always seems to be like a moment where you became a romance reader like mm-hmm. some people like discover it on like an aunt's shelf some people find like an old box somewhere uh maybe you're older what was your sort of when did you become like a romance reader and then were you immediately like I want to write this or how did you come to then be a writer Um, I can't tell, some people can remember the book and all of that, which I cannot. I just feel like, I feel like I always was a romance reader. Mm -hmm. Ever since I was a reader, I sort of gravitated towards stories that were romantic or I would look for the romantic thread in the story. You know, maybe I was just a, a dreamy sort of type of girl, you know, even though I'm the most jaded person I know. (laughs) <laughs> the most jaded, crankiest person I know is me. But I've always gravitated toward the love thread in any sort of story that I read. But my it seems everything seems to go back to Nana. Isn't that fishy? Huh? I would you know, blame. It's my late grandmother, but I'm blaming her for things. But her mm-hmm. and my mother. Uh, I'll blame them both. Don't don't they always get the blame? My kids will probably blame me. But I think I started reading. Har- probably reading Harlequins at 11 or 12 because my grandmother had Harlequins on her on her shelf and I would just take take her books you know I was a book nabber and I was I was always a reader I was always I was an early reader as a kid just reading anything um and my mother was a like a Sydney Sheldon Jackie Collins kind of reader fan and I would I would take those books I love Jackie Collins I was like huge Jackie Collins fans like I love all the I love the the fast pace and the glitz and all that kind of stuff and you know and I thought you just like picture your covers yeah picture the covers love them like I thought they Mm -hmm. were like the sexiest thing anything that was like sexy and glamorous and wonderful I loved all of that just loved it and I I thought they were fabulous and so I've always I've always loved romance and just just been a been a huge romance reader you know, I was like, I was like, what other, what other books are there? You know, I was like, what? I have to go to school and what classics? Oh, come on with that. It's like, okay, I did. It's like, sure, I would. It's like, that's great. 
<laughs> but, you know, can I, now can I go and read my romances, you know, but like even before that, when, you know, when it was the, you know, the Judy Blooms and things like that, just give me the, give me the romantic books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give me those books. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you basically, I always find people, it's so interesting when people have professional lives that like aren't a straight line, because I think most people's aren't, and people get nervous sometimes of like, well, I went to school for this, and I can't transition, but you transitioned from fashion yes. to writing, so yes. can you tell me a little bit about that, and the impetus for that, and um, what advice you well, might have for people? <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't a it wasn't any sort of like glamorous lovely transition it was sort of I would say more of a forced transition more of a just like okay what are you gonna do next now what are you gonna do what are you gonna do now what are you gonna do now woman um the story is not quite you know the prettiest one my job in fashion was um it was a it was a it was a fine job. I loved actually. I loved working. I loved the creativity of it. As you can tell from talking to me, like you know, I love creating things. So I loved working in fashion. I loved the idea of you know, coming up with the designs, the color palette. That part I still you know, will doodle and will sketch and will come up with you know, colors and choices and things like that. That part I loved. Um, but it was a very busy job that I had that involved travel long hours, things like that. And I had, I had two young children. I had twins at the time and uh, lost my babysitter who was picking the kids up from their, pre, their uh, preschool. They were in preschool or right before first grade. And uh, she, no, she no longer could pick them up and I needed to leave work a half an hour early so that I could pick them up from aftercare. And my boss at the time, you know, I asked to leave a half an hour early. I would take work home. I was taking work home anyway. I was, and I, I asked for that half an hour leave and they wouldn't go for it. And I said, well, what can I do? <laughs> I can't leave my kids on a street corner with absolutely nobody. And they were like, well, we, we need you here. So, so when that choice came, I was like, well, I really cannot leave my children on a street corner. I have to. So I have to I have to I have to quit. So I had to make the decision to leave that job, you know, which, you know, to me, the sort of heart wrenching, not heart wrenching, the sort of knife in the heart part of that, that is, is my boss, you know, was a single mother, her, was a single mother. I was, you know, I was, you know, I was married. I still am married to my husband. But I was like, wow, she really was not getting that. Like, no matter what, she was just like, too bad, too sad. And I was like, wow, that stinks, you know? So, um, you know, uh, talked to my husband, made the decision for me to leave. You know, his job had better health care anyway. So I went on and uh, left and, uh, you know, said I didn't expect to be a stay-at-home mother for the length of time I did. You know, I looked for freelance work and things like that, but it didn't quite, you know, didn't quite work out. So I did a lot of other different type of jobs. I worked, I found retail jobs with, with hours that, you know, worked with the time that my children were in school and things like that. But during all that time, you know, that I would do the retail work and the time, the hours that I didn't have um, work, I was still like, you know, book a day reader. <laughs> My mind was clicking a lot faster back then when I could still read a book a day. You know, a book a day reader reading, you know, tons of romances, tons of different things. And um, one day I just sort of like, it sort of just hit me that I wanted more. And I was like, I was like, you know, maybe I could do this. Like story ideas started coming to me. And I said, I'm going to try to write a book. I think I can write a book. Like, like who says I think I can write a book? Who do you who do you think you are, Missy? And that's what I kind of you know. But I said I think I can write a book, and I wrote I wrote a book. It was horrible, really not a great book. Um, but then I was like, what did I know? I was like, I'm going to send this book out, and I did, and I got the rejections that I should have got, plenty of them. <laughs> I was like this. And they were like, thank you, but no, thank you, ma'am. Um, and I remember getting the rejections and saying, well, this is too hard. I'm not doing this anymore. And my husband being him, sort of like flipping, who was sort of like, you know, Mr. Unbothered, but can be really like kind of sharp when he wants. And I think it's sort of a challenging thing he does. He goes, well, then you just give up too easy. 
And he just sort of said it and walked away. And I was so mad that he said that, you know, because he was sort of like, not like, oh, you can do it. You know, he was like, you can do it. I believe in you. He just sort of said, well, you just give up too easy and walked away. And I will never forget. I was like, I will. And I said, I will show him. And then it took like, you know, 11 years or maybe even longer later for me to finally get somebody to say yes. Cause I was like, well, I'll show you, I won't give up. I'm going to write another book and another one, and I'm going to keep querying. And that's kind of how I started writing. <laughs> I, well, I love that you have the relationship with your husband that he knew what you would respond to and also knew that this was something that you really like needed. Um, mm -hmm. And also that you just have the tenacity that you're like 11 years I'll go 20. Like, it's going to happen for me, and I'm just going to keep working. Um, yeah, I'm, kind of, love I'm a little mean like that. It's like, <laughs> it's like you know, rejections hurt. I will cry a little bit. And, you know, it's sort of the advice I give lots of writers now if they ask me. I'm like, you know, they really hurt. They suck. But you just sort of have to, you know, definitely cry to yourself, cry to your friends, talk about it. But know that that's, if, if, if you really feel you want it, just keep going. I would get get a rejection in. This was this was back in self-addressed stamped envelope days. Then they went out to email queries. I would get I would get a rejection in. Look at it, see what to do, and then send out two more queries. One rejection meant two queries for me. Mm. It was rough, you know. And it's not like you know I still get rejections. I still get plenty of rejections today. <laughs> yeah, you know, it all writers go through that. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter once you're published or not. You at the end of the day, you always just start again with a blank page and that's the Absolutely. exciting thing and that's I think the tough thing for this is writing. Exciting thing and, the tough thing. and you know yeah. and the, the writing does not unfortunately I thought it would it does not get easier for I mean maybe for some people you know and good for them if <laughs> if it does get easier I, I will not be their friend I will probably not even like them I will <laughs> secretly I might smile at them but I will secretly hate them but the writing doesn't get any easier the, you know, the blank page is still the blank page. And, you know, you look at it and you're like, how do you, how did I do that? You know, each time it's like, I'm a what? I worked in accounting for a while and I just stuck with that because those numbers you can, those, you know, there's a formula to certain, you know, so it's scary, you know, and maybe creative things, creative things should be a little bit scary, I feel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not a little bit fearful, maybe you're relaxing a little too much. You're not doing it right. And just because you mentioned formula, you know, what do you say to people who do who are like dismissive of romance and say it's always the same book or all that stuff? They, they probably have not read it, have mm -hmm. not read romance or not read enough romance or or any new romance. And uh, I think it's so e so easy for people to dismiss certain things, especially when it comes to romance. It's easy for people to dismiss anything that is, you know, female, women centric, um, and are centered. And pretty much that's probably the end of my answer. It's so easy for them to, <laughs> to dismiss anything, you know, when it's centered on women. It's like, oh, that you know, that thing that that little woman is, you know, putting together. It's like, you know. You know, I often get, I often get, and this comes from people who know me for a while. It's like, you know, it's like how many books later, 11 books, 12 books. I don't, I don't know that I've written and, and I get from people who haven't seen me in a while. And they're like, oh, are you still writing, still writing those books? Are you still writing your books? It's like, oh, you mean my job? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's easy to be dismissive of romance. I think just because it's a female driven industry and women are making money at it, you know, it's like, but, but, you know, they dismiss what they what they don't know, what they don't know and don't care to, you know, put their mind to in research. But if they did, then they probably and those that do suddenly think it's the greatest thing and want to stick their foot in it or, or stick mm -hmm. their hand in it and try to figure out how to work it. You know, it's just it's a, it's annoying for anyone out there who hasn't read romance yet. Who would you suggest that they read? Like, who are you reading now that you really love? Other than, obviously, your book, Real Men Knit, everyone should pre-order right now. But other than that. I would, that, I yeah. would do that. You know, <laughs> I would never suggest that. I would not let somebody else do that. Um, who do I suggest that they read? There's so many people. Let's see. I'm just going to go like I know. Two. I didn't warn you. And now it's just like, what's your favorite movie? It's like an impossible I question. Suggest, no, I, ha I have suggestions. 
I'm going to suggest, well, I all, mm, well, this is not out yet, so it's not fair, but people can pre-order it. Um, I'm definitely going to suggest The Boyfriend Project from Farrah Rashan, because that's like, like my top book and I love it so much. Um, the Bromance Book Club and the one that just came, the one that just came out, just came out a minute ago. Bromance Undercover, Undercover Bromance. Bromance Undercover. I love, I love her writing so much. I love her writing. Um, Andy, Andy Christopher. I love Andy Christopher. Oh, Priscilla Oliveras. Island Temptation. Well, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. It was really fun thank to talk you. to you. I and, want to thank you right. so much. So much fun. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate it too, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Erin Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.